Welcome back, gang. Thanks for joining me on this video for Tales from the Loop, the board game, alpha build, print and play. Uh, jump on over to the Kickstarter in the campaign page. You'll see a link to the print and play files. Print those suckers out and get into the game yourself and uh, let us know what you think. Diary cards are the heartbeat of Tales from the Loop. During the setup of the scenario, it'll tell you which of these cards you'll set up and have as active cards. Start all diary cards when they become active on side A. The exception to this is Odd Sightings. Diary card number two is identical on both side A and side B. It's primarily a reference to let the players know how both Insight and Enigma will raise. Over here on diary card number 30, it'll tell you what's going on in the islands, where you need to maintain your focus, and a little bit of a flair for making sure the characters know what it is they need to be focusing their attention and actions on. And there will be a point when a diary card will come out. I don't want to spoil anything for you. A diary card will come out. It'll tell you this is how you win or, hey, you've lost. Normally things that are going to cause a game to lose could be the enigma or the mystery is getting too great for the kids to discover. So again, a spoiler, something you might consider that the game as the enigma rises, if it reaches a certain threshold, that might be a lose condition. Multiple diary cards can be active at the same time. Now I've said throughout my videos that the game of Tales from the Loop, the board game, is very narrative heavy. So trust me, diary cards are your go-to if you want to advance the game and get to that win condition. I don't want to spoil anything for you, so just trust me. Go through the diary cards, you'll find out what it is. The eureka moment when everything happens is what this game is all about. You may not know how you're going to win right away or how you're going to lose the game right away, but as long as you're pushing those cards forward and you're focusing on those, you might discover, oh, I lost this time, but I might have an idea of how to win next time. Focus on diary cards to push the narrative. Focus on rumor locations. And also focus on your chore cards to allow yourself to get even more benefits. Turns are kept track of here on the weekly schedule. As turns progress, you move from Monday through Sunday. As you move into Friday of the first week, your chore cards that were distributed to you during the setup phase will check to see if the threshold is met and if you completed it in order to draw a week two chore. As you move into the weekend, this is a special round. During the special round, the event text on the school cards that are drawn is ignored and each character receives three extra time tokens during this turn only for a total of nine. As you move into the second week, you'll notice that chores are checked on Thursday and again the weekend gives you that special event round and if you get to the second week and you still haven't completed or f you, ha you still haven't won or you still haven't lost just move the token back over into the uh, first week consider it a third week uh, and then continue with the game and try to uh, meet the objective. Alright let's talk a little bit about dice rolls and helping. In this scenario, we've got Veronica and Lena in the same open location here at Morby, location November. Veronica just took a move action and moved from the school into Morby, and Lena was already at location November. Now, Veronica, on her second action, is going to take an investigate action at location N, which is identified by a rumor token. You're going to immediately flip over the card and see what the test is. Now we've got a strange hum. We read the flavor text, we look at what the test is going to be, and then Veronica is going to start with her base dice of three. She's going to look and see if this icon or this tag matches her tag on her character sheet. So it doesn't match her strength and it doesn't match her weakness, so she's still at a base dice of three. Now, Lena decides to help Veronica, so what Lena needs to do is take one of her time tokens and spend it. Remember, spending is putting a time token into the portrait area. 
that's going to give Veronica an extra die to roll in her dice pool. And oh my gosh, what is this? Veronica has in her possession the item D64 computer. It does match the icon tag here because of the color, so that item is going to give her an additional die. Now let's say that we had multiple blue cards. For every blue card item that you have, you could get one extra die. So if you had a full set of blue cards in your inventory, remember you can only have a maximum of four, you would get one die per card right now as I understand it. So uh, anybody want to put comments uh, in the section below, I will make an edit to that, but uh, that's how I understand the rules. While you'll be extremely strong in that specific area of your stats, you're going to be weak in others. Alright, so we take our dice pool, and we were looking for sixes, and we got two sixes. But wait, something has happened in the loop, and Veronica, and Veronica thought, thought she rolled two successes, successes but she but didn't. She... Okay, so let's say that this was the scenario and this was the roll. So Veronica could push, and the way that she pushes is takes one of her time tokens and places it on any of her conditions. Let's say there was an existing condition there, she has to take one that's more severe, so make sure you place it below the most severe that's there. Uh, so he, she could choose scared or injured. So let's say she had no conditions, she's gonna take exhausted because all it does is take up a time token and that will let her reroll all of her dice. Guess what? She failed that roll, and a character can only push once in a action, so that would be the end of that action. All right, first thing at the beginning of the school phase, make sure that all of the kids are back at the school location, and that's in location M. Uh, the school phase happens at the beginning of every day in a day of Tales from the Loop, the board game. The first player is going to draw the top card off of the school deck and then place it face up uh, in front of them uh, just so that uh, the individual can read it. And we're going to resolve the card from top to bottom and we're going to do four things. We're going to look at number of rumor cards that are going to come out, who is going to be doing the test, if there is a firmware upgrade icon and then the icons on the bottom and the top we're going to reference on the drawn card and then the previous discarded card. Alright so I've got a couple of cards out here to give you sort of an example of the rumor uh, portion of the school phase. You're going to look at the top left corner and you can see you can have a one rumor card drawn, two X is the number of players minus one, and sometimes you'll even have a uh, space here that doesn't have a number at all, so just make sure that those card numbers are the ones that are drawn and will go over to the rumor draw deck. Alright, so let's say that we are in a second round and we were told that in the detention card up at the top left of that card there's a number one so that's going to indicate that I'm going to draw one card and put that out into starting with space one now it's going to uh, replace whatever card uh, is at space number four that's going to be alpha and it's going to be pushed off so we would push alpha off three would go to four two to three one to two and then the new rumor card Charlie would be the one that would come out all right, so here's a different scenario. Let's say that we drew this card, Substitute Teacher, and you can see in the top left of uh, the corner, there's a number three up here. And let's see how that would go. So we would draw three cards. Now we know that the uh, before we do this, we wanna make sure that we push uh, space number three, we would simulate that we completed that rumor on the previous day. So we would first slide down the cards now there's a uh, open space, everything slid over to the right. Now we would want to draw three cards. So the first one is going to be Charlie. We need to draw a second one, so we're going to have to push spot number four, which is X. I apologize for the glare there. X would go off the board, and that would be considered a failure in relation to the scenario cards. And in odd sighting scenario cards, which we kind of covered in the uh, previous uh, look, the whenever a 
test on any rumor card is failed, we're going to raise the Enigma. So that is uh, one way that the Enigma track can go up. All right, so we've drawn one card. The second card, we're going to have to slide down the track. That's going to be card number two. Now, this situation, we've got an A, and we've got another A on the board. So even though we weren't able to complete A on the previous turn, A would come off. We would slide the cards down and then add a new A to the board. Uh, something uh, to consider is if, let's say that we had a K out on space one, two, three, or four, and the track is full after we did our rumor uh, draw, and K was the top of the deck, you could foresee that we would need to complete K if it was already out here because we know it would be pushed off and uh, considered a failure uh, on the next day. After the rumor track is filled up, make sure that every displayed location letter has a rumor token placed near the space on the board to indicate to the characters where they need to focus their attention to solve those rumors. All right, so we're going to be looking at the icon just to the right of the title banner. You've got the single, only the first player rolls, and cannot receive any help. You have an individual test. Every player has to make the roll individually and cannot receive any help. And finally, we have a group test. The first player rolls and may receive help from up to two other players. All right, so when you're doing the event and you've uh, indicated who's going to be doing the event, you read the flavor text, highly recommend that. This is a very narrative heavy uh, game. You're going to uh, look and see what it is that the uh, test tag is. So look at your character sheet. All right, so let's say for the detention school card, Lena was a first player. This is a single event. So she would read the flavor text. She would look and see if she gains any benefit. Again, she's going to be doing a test. So she'll get her base of three die, looks to, at her tags to see what her strength and weaknesses are. If she has a strength that matches the type of test that's being done, she's going to add two dice. Now let's say that slow was inside this icon space here. She would actually minus two die and roll a single die. So here's a different example. If Veronica was the first player and we drew Magnetrine Crash, it is a single test. We read the flavor text, we look at the test, and if there's any benefits, she'd take her base three die, check and see if any of her strengths or weaknesses are indicated on the test. She has a weakness here, so she's going to take that initial dice pool of three and minus two, and she'll roll to try to complete the Magnetron Crash with one die trying to get a six. Highly recommend you keep track and awareness of what your strengths and weaknesses are so that your dice pool can change dynamically. Uh, and then based on whether or not you rolled a success, remember sixes are success, you just need one uh, out of your entire dice pool. Uh, failures, take what you gain or what you uh, lose, and then uh, we'll move on to the firmware upgrades. And we're going to draw during the school phase, and we have a card sensor sweep and the bottom left corner has a firmware upgrade icon. If it does, we check to see if the previous discarded card from the previous turn also has a firmware upgrade, and that will indicate whether or not the firmware upgrade activates. All right, so now that we know that the firmware upgrade has triggered, you need to look at the machine sheets. That's all machine sheets, and we're going to see whether or not the machines are hacked or not. If they are not hacked, all you need to do is look at the firewall token track at the bottom and remove the rightmost firewall token and that's it. The machine is ready to go. Now let's say that the machine is hacked and we'll go over hacked in a later portion of the video. If the machine is hacked, which means it's being controlled by the characters, you're going to remove all of the firewall tokens. You're going to make the system or the machine itself reset and resetting is removing all the firewall tokens and then it's going to lo no longer be hacked or controlled by the character and the machine is going to re return to its starting location indicated on the scenario. Uh, if there's multiple locations based on the scenario then you return it to the location that is closest to where the machine was when the firmware upgrade triggered. 
So for machine movement, we're going to look at the bottom of the previously discarded card and the top of the current school card. We're going to show that the four blocks here indicate that the worker and the warden are going to move. The worker is going to move one space to the east and the warden is going to move one space to the north. And because this icon here has the plus icon inside the arrow, you're going to look at the top left of the discarded card that has the double black border and it tells you that the warden is going to move an additional space uh, one to the east. So let's look at that. Okay, so we're going to go from left to right. We're going to start with the worker. Now it says that the worker is going to move one space. That's sector, not location. Machines move by sectors. Going to move one sector to the east. So we'll move him into that space. Machines can move through spaces that have existing machines, but they can't end their movement in a space with a machine. So in this situation, the fire guard would be taking a movement to the north uh, into a space with the Mark 79 and if he would take a space movement to the left he would be able to do that because he's ending in a space that does not have a machine in it. Uh, but in this case because the fire guard is moving one to the north and then one to the east he'd be moving into an amphibious space and the fire guard is not amphibious so the entire move would be cancelled. Now let's say the fire guard was down here to the south and the Mark 79 was in this position he could move one up and then one to the east and end his movement without a machine in his space but if he has a single movement and he was to stop there, the move would be canceled. Now be cautious if you ever have a machine that is going to be asked to move into an amphibious space or a water space, as you see by this icon here. Uh, if they're not amphibious, they cannot move in that space and you'll just go ahead and cancel that movement. But wait, there's more! So let's say that the watchdogs were in Bravo 5 nearby open location Charlie and the school cards moved the watchdogs down and then to the left and now they're entering into a restricted location those watchdogs will go into alert status if a machine ever moves into a sector that intersects both a restricted location and an open location the machine will go into routine mode an alert machine nearby an open location will go back to routine mode during the cleanup step in the home phase if it hasn't been a target of hacking this turn. Hey, remember those diary cards? Make sure you're looking at them and making sure that you are pushing forward the narrative. During the adventure phase, we're going to talk about trading items, time tokens, spending time tokens, and actions. Okay, so let's say in this scenario, Lena, Nils, and Veronica are all in the same location at the school because they just finished a school phase. They're starting their adventure phase. At the very beginning of the adventure phase, two or more characters can trade items freely amongst themselves. Hey, Lena likes all the purple cards, so hey, Veronica, can you give me that purple card? Done. Now let's say at a later time in the game... Veronica really enjoyed that hairspray. She wants to get it back from Lena. As long as Lena and Veronica, two or more characters, are in the same location. Now, because it's after the beginning of the venture phase, one of the participants that are deciding to trade, that could be two or more characters, spends one time token. So spending a time token is placing the time token on the character's portrait, and then they can carry out the trade. Something to keep in mind as you start to collect items or trade items, characters can never accumulate more than four items in their possession, including their iconic item. All right, let's take a quick look at anomaly cards and item cards. As you collect item cards, they can give you the ability to roll additional die if their color matches what the test is. They also have a second ability with combos. So if I have glue and fire, if I want to make an explosive, I take fire 
and I combine it with glue, which I have glue from the chewing gum, and I can make an explosive. These explosives will sometimes allow you to auto success on specific tests. Item cards and anomaly cards can usually be acquired through rumors and sometimes schools or just basically doing the things that you do in the game. Those are primarily how you earn item cards and anomaly cards. Now anomaly cards, again, they have their own tag, their own combo tag, but they also have uses. Now just use a time token or any other kind of token that you have that you've accumulated to do this print and play and put two tokens on there. You get two uses out of it. Once you use your last use, it's gone. Also, be aware that when you use specific items to combine, they are discarded. Taking a look at the character sheet, we're going to look at the uh, icon here, the time token icon. Anytime you see that, it's referring to the time tokens that you place here on the character sheet. There's a difference between using time tokens to take actions and then time tokens when they're required to be spent. So anytime a card or effect of the game tells you to spend a time token, you're going to take a time token from your time token pool, which is normally at the bottom of the character sheet, and you're going to place it on the character portrait. Throughout the game, as you take actions, you're going to take from your time pool and then place those time tokens on a specific action that you want to take. Some of the time token action spaces are going to be a walk. Maybe I want to take a walk action to get towards one of those restricted locations that were displayed down on the rumor display. That's what drives me to take a walk action to get where it is that I want to go to discover those things that are important to me. And keep in mind, while it costs one to move into an open location, if a character moves into a restricted location, that particular action will cost them two time tokens. However, if a character moves into a restricted location that has had a rumor token and the area has been explored, which means the card has been removed from the rumor display, then moving into a restricted location only costs one time token. Scout Fireguard is nearby location in, so she has the ability to do a scout or an investigate because there is a rumor token here as well. So if she does a scout, she could scout either the location card because it's currently not revealed, or she could scout over and look at firewall tokens for the machine. This could also be a situation for Veronica. Now she's got more choices. She could scout in her current location. She could scout the nearby machine or she could scout adjacent locations that also have a scout token in them. If she decides to do a scout action on the card, she would simply flip the card over. She doesn't have to do the test, but it gives her some insight on what might be required. Hack. Veronica wants to take control of that fire guard there in her nearby sector. Let's see how we do that. A character can try to hack a nearby machine by putting one time token in their hacking action space. This allows them to hack one of the machine's firewalls. As you can see, a couple of the firewalls laid out here with their routine side and their alert side. Any other characters in the same location with the current active player can help as usual. Note that each firewall hacked is a distinct action, so different characters can take on different ones. So if you have characters that have strength, here in red as we have Nils here or have strength in green like Veronica make sure that you have a good team of characters making it easier to get through potential options however when it comes to firewalls that require two rolls as we see here on this firewall token on the alert side we have two different distinct tests the same character has to roll both times although characters that are in the same location can still help with both rolls by spending one time token as usual. Each machine has a number of firewalls that work like obstacles the hacker must overcome to take control of the machine. Each machine has a number of firewalls that the hacker must overcome in order to take control of the machine. As we see here on the machine sheet, there are four firewall spaces. The first two here on the fire guard are stock, which means they're always filled and you'll always have to bypass these. Then you have the backup, which are hollowed. 
Together these make up the firewall track. As we said, these are the stock firewalls. The machine will always have these, while the backup spaces are firewalls that may activate during a hack. Now in the beginning of the game, all of these firewall spaces are going to be empty. But as the game progresses, firewall tokens drawn from a bag will be added. Each machine also has default firewall on their response cards, both on the routine side and on the alert side. When a firewall token is drawn with this symbol, refer to the default firewall token symbol on the bottom of the response card. The test and what will occur are listed in the text on the response card. All right, so to hack a firewall, player puts the time token in the hacking space, checks the first space of the firewall track. If it's empty, as we see here, we're going to draw from the token bag. Now I've got a couple of firewall tokens that each one of these firewall tokens are, are representing or at least have a representation of the possible icons that you'll encounter when you draw a firewall token from the bag. So let's say that we drew this firewall token from the bag. A firewall consists of two main areas. The left is showing the firewall of the machine in routine mode and the right with the hazard stripes in alert mode. The background color indicates which tag is relevant to rolling the test, although these can be bypassed by using specific combos. Sometimes there are firewall effect icons. When resolving a firewall, first resolve the effect, then make a hacking roll if required. Now let's take a look at all the possible effects. There are four firewall effects. Alert. So as soon as the firewall has been resolved, this machine's routine card would flip to the alert side. Backup firewall. We would add one firewall token face up to the first empty backup space on the firewall track. If the firewall track is already full, ignore the effect. Bypass. So the current firewall is bypassed automatically. You still place it onto the track, but it is bypassed. Now remember, if it's in the alert state, you'll ignore the bypass icon and refer to the alert side. And finally, we have the default firewall. You can see the default firewall and many of these icons can show up in either the routine side or the alert side. Default firewall triggers the default firewall of the machine being hacked. You're going to refer to the default firewall section of the response card to see what kind of test needs to be rolled and the particular effect of a failed roll. All right, so we come up on the fire guard. It is in a nearby sector and a location that I've just entered, and I want to carry out a hack action. I've put my time token in one of my four hack spaces. Now he's got four firewalls that uh, are possible, two that I'm gonna at least at a minimum have to get through. Let's draw our first firewall token. All right, our first firewall to get through is going to be a green test, but before I do the test, I need to do the effect. This effect icon tells me I need to add one firewall token to the backup firewall. I've added the token to the first space of the backup firewall, but I need to go back to the firewall token and do the initial test. After successfully hacking this firewall, instead of moving past it to go to the next firewall that's required, the hacker can elect to break it instead. This allows the hacker to control the machine for a short amount of time and make it easier to hack in the future. To break this firewall, all I need to do is put an additional one-time token into the hacking space and flip the hacked firewall. Now that the firewall token is face down, I now have covered it up and it appears that I only have one stock firewall space. After the firewall token is flipped face down, it has now eliminated one of the stock firewall spaces. The hacker also immediately gets to take a single machine write action using the machine. After this hack ends, the machine goes back to normal in its current sector except with one broken firewall. All right, so we come back up on the fire guard and we decide to do another hacking action. Now remember, we did a broken firewall token here. So we got a quick ride, got to control him for a short amount of time, left him alone, and now I'm coming back and I'm starting the hack process again. Now I'm gonna go to the open stock firewall space. This effect is gonna tell me that the machine is gonna become alert after 
the current firewall has been resolved. And this effect tells me that the machine is going to become alert after I complete the current hack. So I do my test, and if I pass, I can make a choice to move on to a separate action by placing another time token in the hack action and move on to the next firewall token. Now remember, because I was in an alert status and I'm moving on to the next firewall token, uh, again, after paying an extra time token on the hack action space, I'm now going to be using the machine's alert side of the firewall token. Now because I had the alert effect, this machine is now in an alert status, I'm going to move over to the right side of the firewall token and I'm going to do a purple test. Now let's rewind a little bit and let's say that we failed one of the tests. If any test has failed during the attempt, immediately check the response card to see how the machine reacts. Now we're going to go back up to the uh, reaction portion of the response card as if we were doing an avoid test. The effects on this card are routine, but if he was in the alert status and we failed, we would use this response. And remember, it affects all characters who participated, including those that helped, in the hack. And hopefully, honestly, you have a machine that's in its routine state and it's relatively docile and a failed hack doesn't have a response at all. Good job, Veronica. We now have control of a machine. Now to be clear, once a machine is hacked, we're going to choose any character that rolled on a hack action against a firewall can choose to take control of the machine. If the character just helped the person that did the roll on the firewall token, they cannot take control of the machine. Now that the fire guard is hacked, I'm going to choose one of the characters. Let's say that I had multiple in the area. I'm going to choose Veronica. I'm going to place the machine miniature by the standee, leaving it in the sectors. I'm going to place the miniature by the standee. For all intents and purposes, they act as one unit until the machine reset. This includes going to school, going home for dinner, and thematically the machine just kind of skulks in the background or hides where it needs to hide. A character with a hacked machine gets access to the special combo tag detailed on the machine sheet. A character with a hacked machine gets access to this special combo tag right here detailed right on its machine sheet. It allows the hacker to bypass certain challenges or tests. The machine under your control can also be used to take a machine ride. It allows the person controlling it to move by grid sectors instead of location paths at the speed of the machine's movement. The transport ability of the machine is the number of characters that can ride it. If there are several models of the same machine type on the board, the person or the hacker taking control only takes control of one of the machines. More could be hacked, but that would constitute a separate hacking attempt bus ride and I can move between two locations with the bus ride icons. Investigate. Now let's say Veronica decided to do an investigate action on the same location in that she's currently at with a rumor token. She would immediately flip over the location card. The rumor would immediately initiate. She would read the flavor text. She would check the test, see what things she would have to uh, do to succeed or fail. Make sure you keep an eye on the combo tags to make sure you don't automatically succeed. If you succeed, you remove the card, take your success, and remove the rumor token. And we look over here at Lena. She's currently in the restricted location L, which is machine breakdown. The rumor card is already face up. So when she takes an investigate action, she's going to go right into knowing what it is that she's investigating. She reads the flavor text. She does the test. She makes sure she doesn't automatically succeed with the combo tag. If she succeeds and she's at a restricted location, remove the card, remove the rumor token. So if you completed a rumor card in that location, you'll put an explored token in the area and that indicates to all the players that moving into that location costs one and moving out of there to go home in time for dinner also costs one. Eight. Rest. Nils has had a nice, long, productive day. Nils has one more time token to use. Nils is going to decide to rest. Put that time token in the rest action. A character can only take one rest action per turn. And when that rest action is taken, the condition exhausted, upset, scared, or injured can be relieved. Because injuries take a little bit of time to work themselves out, he doesn't want to wait, so he'll use that rest action to relieve the injury. When that token comes off of the track, it goes in 
to your portrait as spent. Now before we had a rest action that removed an injured cube that was already all the way to the left. If you have the injured cube anywhere else and you take a rest action, you simply move the injured token one space to the left. And as you take each individual action, you allocate a time token to the space. So the walk action has a total of four times it can be used in a turn. The bus ride can be used twice, and then the rest action can only be used once per turn. All right, talking about the favor track, there is a, another action available to the character as long as the favor tracker is at the topmost position of the favor track, and that is the car ride. In order to pay for the car ride, spend a time token. After moving the time tracker down one space, put a time token in the car space. That makes the car ride unavailable for the remainder of the turn until you come up to the cleanup phase and get that time token back. Maybe I want to take that car ride action. You know, I'm going to have to ask my parents for a little favor. They might not be happy about it, but I want to use that car because I can't drive. I'm just a kid. So I can move from any open location to any other open location on the board. Don't neglect that car ride if you're really needing to save your time tokens for other things. You can use the car ride to go from any location on the board. That means you can go from a restricted location to a open location, but never from an open location to a restricted location. If there's ever a situation to where taking the car ride would move the um, time tracker down into the grounded space, you cannot take the card ride action. Something to remember, no matter whether or not you've taken the car ride action or not, no matter what the position the favor tracker is on the favor track, the home for dinner action spaces are always available to you to allocate time tokens in those spaces based on your need to be home for dinner on time. Being home for dinner on time normally only takes one time token. Now, again, it doesn't matter where your track is at on the favor track. One time token is the base requirement to get home in time. So home for dinner costs are, if you're at an open location, one time token. If you're at a restricted orange location, it's going to cost you two time tokens. If you're at a restricted location with an explore token, the cost goes down to just one. If you're already at your home location and the character's home locations focus only on the letter on the print and play, uh, sometimes the location names won't match. That's okay, it'll be fixed in the uh, final product, but Free League has directed us all to just focus on that H uh, or the other letters on the other characters. Lena is on Charlie, Nils is on Bravo, for example. Just focus on the letter. If you're already at your home location, the cost for home for dinner is zero. Now let's say if you have a hacked machine under your control, the cost is minus one time token. So for example, if you're at a restricted location, the normal cost is two. If you have that hacked machine under your control, it's reduced by one, and now you only have to place one there. Now, if you're already at your home location and it's minus one, you don't get any bonus time, but you don't have to place anything there. If at any time your favor track moves down to the grounded position, it's going to lock two of your time tokens and you will not get those recycled back into your pool at the bottom of your car during the cleanup of the home phase. Um, the only way to get those time tokens back up are by getting home on time to where it will push that favor token up and as soon as that is you are no longer grounded you will get those time tokens back and now conditions have a hierarchy as you take conditions make sure that you place a condition in the more severe so one of the ways to take a condition is by cards another way to take a condition is by pushing which is re-rolling die and we'll kind of talk about pushing later so as you take the condition uh, if it's based on a card and it says become upset you place it in the upset space now let's say that the character decides to push. Now there's a hierarchy here and that's where that comes in. If you do a push and you decide to reroll your die, 
because you didn't get a six, you have to pick a more severe condition to take. So in this case, upset is already taken. We can't take exhausted because it's less severe. So we have to place it in either scared or injured. So looking at the condition, if a character is exhausted, they pretty much just lose a time token and it can be relieved by resting. If the character is upset, they can't get help from other characters. You can relieve this by getting help from other characters or taking a rest action. If a character is scared, they can't use their strength tag to modify their dice pool. It can be relieved by resting and then finally injured. Anytime you take it injured, you're going to place it in the furthest space to the left. It gives you minus two to all tests, and injured is relieved by waiting it out or taking the rest action. Waiting out an injured condition is pushing the block to the right during every cleanup portion of the home phase. If it's on the final spot and you are at the home phase and during the cleanup you move the block off the injured you are no longer injured. Alright as characters move around the board and as machines move around the board if the character and machine are ever nearby each other there needs to be an avoid test. So let's say that Veronica wants to make a movement into the open location November at Morby. She notices there is a Mark 79 machine nearby in sector F8. All right, so things you'll have to look at their response cards. So we're looking at the Mark 79's uh, response cards. They have a standard routine, an erratic routine, and then a standard alert and an erratic alert card. Now the Mark 79 response cards have at least one of the three possible icons that you'll see in their response section. So let's go ahead and take a look at the card real quick. So we've got the test that you have to do what the response is. All the information at the bottom of the response card is their default firewall response whenever you are doing a hack and the firewall token that you reveal or that you're trying to hack has that symbol in it, you'll refer to this portion of the card. But we're gonna be looking up here for failed avoiding tests. Here you can see the response for a standard and a response for erratic. And here at the standard area, you can see he's going to have an ignore. So if the test fails, he'll just ignore you. Nothing will happen. But let's say that the Mark 79 was in an alert status. So in the alert status, we look at what the test is. If we fail the test, we move into the response section. This is a special response icon. In this Mark 79's alert status, a response would be backup call. So the closest warden is going to move nearby sector and immediately try to avoid it. And here you see an example of a block still having to do a test to avoid. If you fail the test, you're going to be blocked. You are pushed back into the location you came from. Let's say that you took a car ride and you came from a non-connected location move to the closest open location if possible. And this one has an extra grabbed, become scared and injured. And a little bit of a difference for the erratic routine side of the Mark 79. He avoids you if you fail the test, but if you fail the test, he doesn't block your movement. You still continue into the location, but he's gonna bull rush you and you'll become scared. Remember those diary cards we were talking about? Make sure you're checking them out. Make sure you're pushing yourselves forward to meet those objectives. And finally, the home phase. In the home phase, the characters return home to dinner, homework, and bed. And hopefully, on time. During this phase, the characters, which are still kids, need to be home in time for dinner. So in this situation, we have Nils at a restricted location Foxtrot. We have Lena at her home location in Charlie, and we have Veronica in an open location, Gulf. She should be over there in H. Let's look at their character sheets and see how not being home on time and being home on time and based on where you're at affects your overall standing on the favor track. Now remember, Veronica was at location G. She needs to be at location H to be home, and she didn't allocate any of her time tokens to being home on time while she was in an open location if the player would have allocated at least one time token to the 
home for dinner space, she would have been spending a time token to move her way back there. But because she didn't, and she took a car ride action and it pushed her down on her favor track already, she didn't make it home on time, so now she's grounded. Alright, and in this setup, if you remember, Lena was at location Charlie, which was her home location. She didn't allocate any time tokens to her home for dinner space because she didn't have to because her home for dinner cost was zero. So because she made it home for dinner on time, her favorite track, because she was really listening to her parents to be home on time, she goes up one space on the favorite track. And finally, let's take a look at Nils. Now remember, Nils was in a restricted location, F, uh, but because during his turn and during all the actions that uh, Nils was taking, uh, looks like he did a little bit of investigation, a little bit of uh, scouting, uh, took a short walk. Uh, he did get upset based on something that happened maybe on one of the cards. Um, he didn't take a ride anywhere, so, but, he did allocate two, which is the cost to get home for dinner, so he made his way back. And because he's already at the top of the favorite track, he's good to go. But because he got home in time for dinner, he doesn't go down on the favorite track. Remember when we talked about moving along the weekly schedule? And finally, Friday comes along. It's the end of the school week. We're about to get up early, but we got to make sure that we check our chore cards. As you take actions throughout the game during the adventure phase, be sure to look back at your chores. Uh, I've got two examples of chore cards here. The chore card on the left is for a week one and the indicate number there at the top right of the corner indicates that it's a week one and on the opposite side uh, when you were originally given this one during week one you can see how chores are divvied up by week one there at the bottom. That's the back of the card and then the front of the card. Um, you can see that the flavor text is fairly common. Make sure you read that. Very heavy on the narrative in the game, so enjoy it. And then uh, what the condition is in order to meet the threshold of chore tokens that you're going to place on the chore card as you complete it. And again, make sure you're keeping an eye on that throughout the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday during the first week. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on chore cards. Uh, you can see here this one is for week two. Same indication on the uh, back of the card. It'll say week two on it. If you've completed your week one successfully, you take the success. If you fail, you take the failure. And then after you've uh, determined if you've succeeded or failed, you'll draw a week two card. All right, let's talk about the threshold. So as you complete this individual uh, task, place a chore token there. Again, these chore tokens that I've uh, supplied on my own, it was just some negatives from another board game. I usually keep all the negatives and tokens because uh, I like to have trackers. So I just took a couple of blank tokens, wrote what looks like a list of chores to do, uh, and then I just use those for tokens. All right, so if you come to Friday, the first week, you will reference your chore card. If you have two chore tokens on there, it'll tell you what it is that you get out of it. And then let's say that the first week you had a uh, failure on that, you'd take the failure condition. Still, either way, if you succeeded or failed in your chore, still draw a week two chore. All right, so now that we're in the cleanup phase, we're going to take certain board effects that might uh, take place if there's tokens out on the board, if there's a card that tells you to take an effect, if there's something in the diary cards, make sure that you're referring to those. Uh, there's certain things like machines, uh, removing their alert state if they haven't been the subject of a hacking action. Uh, also slide all cards that are currently inside the rumor track and slide them down as far to the right as they'll go. This will prepare you for the new school phase and to be prepared for new rumors to be added. And finally, the first player passes the first player token to the player on their left. All time tokens inside the action spaces go back into the time pool as well as from the portrait and the car ride. Any tokens that were allocated to being grounded, as we have over here in Niles, will not come back. He will get the car ride, he will get the what's coming from his action spaces, and he, he will get what's coming from his portrait. But anything that's in the grounded and anything that's in the conditions will not come back at this time. If a character has tokens in the home for dinner spaces, those will also come back to their time token pool.
All right, gang, that's all I've got for you in this video. It's a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be. It took a lot longer than I thought it was going to. I appreciate you sticking around. I'll reiterate all the links in the description below, uh, all the time tags uh, will take you to the other videos. I'm going to be making more. I'll make a full playthrough. I'm also going to make a probably a little bit longer video. <laughs> I know, how can that be possible? But uh, one that those that want to get more into the uh, depths of the rules, I'll, I'll go more over the uh, components a little bit closer, um, a little bit more of the rules that I might have uh, glazed over a little bit here. Uh, but I'm hoping that each one of these individual videos will just get everyone a little bit closer to understanding. Uh, most games that I, uh, I really enjoy, I dig deep in the rules. I make um, you know the player aids that help the game progress a little bit faster maybe for me uh, setting it up. So I do hope that you're jo enjoying these. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, if you'd like me to make a video on a specific topic, um, I'm active as I can be. I haven't been as active in the last couple of days uh, because I've been trying to focus on making this video. And um, I'm going to jump back into the comments section. I need to jump into Board Game Geek a little bit more. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody that's uh, been active in the comments on the Kickstarter page. Please, if you haven't already, jump over there. Check them out. You can get this print and play for free. Thanks to the Free League team, uh, you've got a great game started. I know it's an alpha. I know it's early. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to jump in and uh, try this thing out and be very collaborative uh, with the team. Uh, been, they've been very active, very responsive. So thanks to Martin Takaichi for uh, getting this system together. Uh, it can't be an easy task. Board games are definitely harder than making RPGs. Uh, I can understand that. So I'm looking forward to the uh, next year. I'm going to be making as many more playthrough videos uh, that I um, that I can possibly stand or you guys can possibly stand. So I hope you guys are uh, going along with me. Overall I'm extremely excited. So Make sure that uh, you drop me a couple of comments in the comments section over the Kickstarter page or over on Board Game Geek, and I'll be more than happy to uh, respond to you guys. So thanks again, and as always, share your experiences and stay in the loop. So I'd like to point out uh, Free League corrected me on a uh, video that I did for setup and I wanted to take the time to uh, do a quick correction. During the setup for the bot amok scenario, uh, watchdogs went into sector A4. So anytime a machine enters a sector that is nearby, that means the grid sector intersects the uh, location circle in this case sector A4 does intersect location A and location A is a restricted location you start the or change the machine's routine status to an alert status hey maybe we should check out those diary cards are you curious about what it is that you should be doing to advance the game of Tales from the Loot the board game Diary cards are your go-to location. Are you curious, are you curious about, about what you should what be doing, doing in the Marlin Islands? Islands? Why is that, Why is that robot, robot where it's at? It's at? Should, I should, should, I should I care about the robot? The robot? Should I care about that, that location? location? What, what should, should I be, I be doing? doing? Am I in Am a time paradox? paradox? Your go-to go location, location are those diary, those diary cards. cards. Maybe I haven't mentioned before, but those diary cards, make sure you're advancing them. Yeah, have I said anything about the diary cards yet? Has that erratic behavior number 30 card been sitting there for a while? might want to focus on doing the objective. Hey, I hear there's an interesting thing to focus on in the diary cards. Let's go ahead and read it. How are those diary cards coming? Hey, maybe I haven't talked about... Oh, I have? Okay.